Let us learn to walk in the paths of God, as shown to us as we hunger for God's word and for God's ways. Let us own the good news of Christ among us. May we be filled with a spirit of hopeful joy. Creator God, we come together this day to place our lives in your care and to offer ourselves to your service. During this hour of prayer, O Lord, we ask that the power of your Spirit might possess us so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, praying in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We pray for Penny Putnam, for Nicole Siriello, for Perry Green, for Linda Fisk, Nancy Keefe, Marcy Miller, Fred Paris, Karen Canselmo, Glenn Wynn, Finn Daly, Ricky Eads, Kayla Daly, Suzanne, Christina, Stephanie, and family, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, living with a rare blood disorder, and their parents, and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, all who are afflicted with and by the virus, all innocents caught up in war. Almighty God, whose word endures forever, we come with thankful hearts and with souls aflame, for you have not withheld from us knowledge of your truth and your love. We acknowledge that in the person of your Son, Jesus of Nazareth, and in the power of your Spirit, that blessings come to all who approach you, seeking your presence and your will in order to live life fully and abundantly. Author of every good thing, we thank you for the gift of Scripture through which we can become inspired. Teach us to use such inspiration to bring enlightenment to others as well as confidence to ourselves. Aid us through your Spirit in the interpretation of your word, so that your desires for us might not only be known, but might also be attained, 
as we go about our daily lives in this world which you so lovingly created. God of our forebears, in gratitude, we testify that the light and understanding which you have shown to your creation is unchanging, that your verities are eternal, so that our joys might abound and our peace might pass all understanding. Knowing that our redemption in Christ is assured, we pray that we might ever obey you as we live enlightened lives, with minds filled with your wisdom and spirits ennobled with grace. Prosper our work in building your kingdom, assisting us through your goodness and virtue. May the hope that comes from faith motivate us to persevere, and may the love which overflowed at the creation fill us completely. For it is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Psalm 147, 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Revelation chapter 19 Verses 5 through 9. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and all who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Luke chapter 1, 49 through 55. The Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. 
He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. A few decades ago, a small book made quite a splash in business circles in this country. It was partially based on the premise that every once in a while you should catch somebody doing something right and then praise them for it. The book was entitled The One Minute Manager and it purported to give supervisors a way of getting more effective mileage from people they supervise. I wonder why this book should have caused such a stir. Surely the message wasn't all that revolutionary. And if it was revolutionary, then certainly it wasn't all that new. For about 2,000 years ago, Someone spent about three years walking the streets of towns and villages in Palestine, preaching how nice it would be if we would just be decent to each other for a change. But then we all know what happened to him for his trouble. Maybe it's because nice guys finish last in the kingdom of this world that we rarely go out of our way to praise others, except when it doesn't cost us anything to do so, or when we want to get something out of them. The old, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours way of doing business. Or when that rare occasion presents itself when we are genuinely overwhelmed at what others have done. All too often, we operate in just the opposite manner, or say nothing at all. In fact, saying nothing at all seems to be the order of the day. Have you ever noticed that a lot of people have very little to say to God, or even to say about God, except when things start to go wrong? When all is going well, we enjoy giving ourselves that pat on the back, reassured that we are captains of our own ship, rulers of our own fate. But when something goes wrong, it's, well, what kind of a god are you anyway? You're not doing me very much good. Maybe if we paid more attention to the kind of god that God is in the first place, we would come to realize that God is not there just to take the blame when we start looking for a scapegoat. God went through that scene at Calvary, and I doubt if he'll let us try and pull that trick on him again. Our three scripture passages for this morning try to give us some kind of idea of what our God is like. And if we would just let ourselves try to see God the way God reveals himself, 
instead of just seeing what we want to see, maybe we would be less inclined to ignore him, except in those cases of last resort. It's funny, the last resort. My typing teacher in high school had the following message posted on the wall in his class. When all else fails, read the directions. If we would apply that to our spiritual lives, perhaps we would not have to go running to God yelling, come fix it, because we would have allowed God to be there from the very beginning. And I have a sneaking suspicion that in cases like that, things are less likely to go wrong in the first place. Now, what does the psalmist say God is like? First of all, as we heard in our unison reading, David sees God everywhere. Not only does God do all the things we mortals expect him to do, putting the stars up in the sky and making rain to fall and taking care of nature in general, God also resets the imbalance which humanity has introduced into the creation. Now, that's revolutionary in more ways than one. For one thing, it asserts that God actively intervenes in human affairs, or so we are told. When is the last time that has happened to you? How often does that happen to you? When is the last time you let God intervene in your life to mend your broken heart? When was the last time you brought to God your wounds to be healed? When is the last time you let God do anything for you? When is the last time we have opened our ears to hear the good tidings that we have been promised? I don't mean here in worship, where somehow we expect to hear that kind of thing, even if half the message is forgotten by the time we are half the way home. But when have we let God speak to us in other places, at other times? Scripture tells us that the heavens themselves are telling the glory of God. But do we hear that? When do we allow any act of kindness to be performed for one another? Because in doing so, we are doing those acts of kindness to Christ himself. But do we see Christ's face in our neighbors' faces? Is it there? When is the last time we have heard the proclamation of liberty to the captives? When have we sought freedom from doubts, from petty concerns, from feelings of betrayal and from carelessness? Or do we stay prisoners in our towers like the damsel in distress, unaware that the dragon has already been slain, that victory has been won, and that the warfare is long over? When is the last time we have let God be God instead of what we expect God to be? Maybe it is because we have our own notions of what God is like that we rarely praise God for who he actually is. Perhaps it is due to our own agendas, our own priorities that cause us to miss what the divine message has to communicate, missing what the divine nature has to impart, forgetting what the divine mission has to accomplish in our lives and in the lives of others. The writers of the Psalms 
of revelation of the Gospels did not have that problem. Instead of having their thoughts of God ruled by ideas of what could be done for themselves, they let God do the doing and in response were thankful. And like the one minute manager, they discovered a couple of things. Praising God for who God is, ruler, healer, provider, bestower of blessings, of mercies, of holiness, led themselves to become more aware that God's will and our own both benefit from working together. There is no sense having a tug of war with our creator, a war of wills, because we're not going to win it anyways. Praising God should be the most natural of responses on our part, because it comes from the realization that teamwork makes for the best results. Another realization that should occur to us from praising God is that the entire atmosphere of our lives is transformed to positive from negative, to fulfilled from empty, to open from shut in upon ourselves. We can have the attitude that this is our own little life and if God doesn't want to play by our rules, we will take our ball and go home. Or we can see that we do not always have all the answers, that we do not always know what is best for ourselves, and that others do have something to offer if we would only let them. Finally, Praise of God gives a message, not only to ourselves and to our Creator, but to others. We shouldn't begin to think that we are the only ones in the world with problems, with difficulties, and with troubles. We do not have a monopoly on either curses or blessings, but we do know that in the end, we will be weighed in the balance by a God who is not so much concerned with whether we are a success or not, but he is concerned about how we have lived our lives with what we have been given. We will be weighed in the balance by a God who is concerned not so much with the splash that we make, but with the faith that we keep. We will be weighed by a God who is concerned not so much with our contribution to this world, but with our witness to the world, to life, to love, as God meant them all to be. For these and for all good things, let us praise his name. Amen.
May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.